Well, it was revealed this week that the UK economy saw no growth in February after being hit by the effects of strikes by public sector workers. The ONS says a rise in construction activity has been offset by walkouts by teachers and civil servants. And as we discussed a moment ago, uh, nurses in the Royal College of Nursing Union have rejected the government's pay offer in England and will now go on strike over the first May bank holiday. So are we set for more economic stagnation? Join me now is political commentator Matthew Stadlin and communications officer at the IEA, Harrison Griffiths. Good afternoon to both of you. Matthew, let's start with you. So unusually, uh, we have um, the economic downturn not being blamed on Brexit, but on strike action. Tell us the story. Yeah, well, it seems because there were two teachers' strikes in February, one at the very beginning of the month and one towards the end of the month, as well as that mass walkout by civil servants. I think 100,000 civil servants at the beginning of February didn't turn up to work. That has had an impact, unsurprisingly, on the economy. That's the story in a nutshell. But if you want the wider picture, big concern is that the economy has been flatlining since last spring. So for pretty much a year now, we haven't seen much overall growth. People are really struggling, aren't they, with the cost of living. Lots of viewers of GB News will be up in arms that inflation is still 10%. And then you've got the effects partly of that Liz Trust debacle, partly wider factors as well. The interest rates are high. They're, they're high because of inflation. They're high because of the mistakes that Liz Trust made. They're high because, high because of wider issues. They're now at 4.25%. So for people who've got mortgages, and there are millions of those around the country, they're being hit twice. They're being hit first by inflation, which has skyrocketed over the last year or so. And they're also being hit with their mortgages. For those sorts of people, if we're talking about how the land lies politically ahead of the next general election, those are the sorts of people who might swing towards Labour, notwithstanding what Olivia said just now. I thought her analysis was very good, by the way. Thank you very much. Harrison Griffiths bringing you in now. Were you as surprised as I was to see particularly the BBC reporting that this was due to strikes and not the oppressive regime of Brexit or the Tory government? Well, uh, a risk of going a little bit more sympathetic to unions than the BBC, it seems like the actual impact of strikes on the stagnating GDP in February was actually sort of reasonably low, about 0.2%. Uh, but the psychological impact of that is that that meant that we hit zero growth. And now 0.2% growth is still absolutely atrocious. But being at that exact point of stagnation uh, really does show where we are as a country at the moment. And if you do look at the ONS's uh, statistics on which sectors of the economy contributed less to our overall GDP in February compared to January, you do see education, you do see transport, and you see uh, payroll tax contributions like national insurance in there. So it has certainly given us a hit, but I think it's a pretty small contribution compared to the sort of broader uh, policy platform that is delivering us economic stagnation at the moment, high taxes, bad regulation and illiberal planning laws. OK, Matthew, coming back to you, if strikes are the cause of the problem, um, it would seem ending them is a solution, but it's going to be very expensive to end all these strikes. So how do we balance that act off? It's, I think you'll agree is that we're in a, a bit of a pickle as a country at the moment. It's not just Britain, although what Olivia was saying earlier was spot on, that we are predicted by the IMF, whether or not you're a, a fan, we're predicted to be the slowest growing economy of the, of the G7. That should give us real cause for concern. But we're in a pickle. Why are we in a pickle? Because we don't seem to be able to afford ourselves. So I don't, very, very few people, you might get a few militants, of course, for whom I have no sympathy, but very few people want to go on strike. And if nurses are going on strike, as they are, again, as you've just covered, on the May bank holiday, and potentially putting critical care services for the first time in jeopardy, such as intensive care, that's because they really don't think they're getting a, a deal that they deserve. Nurses go into, the, into their profession because they want to help people, because they want to keep people alive. So yes, they may be manipulated by some militants, but the vast majority will be doing it because they simply can't make ends meet. I was reading just last night about a junior doctor, 31 year old, who does obviously very valuable work, works I think in a cardiology department in a hospital up in the north, first year out of, out of study, so first year junior doctor. She's earning 14 pounds an hour and she's doing two extra jobs on top of her full time job 
in order just to pay the bills. Not so she can go out partying, but in order to pay the bills. This is someone who is keeping us alive and keeping the parents of many viewers of GB News and the siblings and the children, literally keeping them alive if they have heart problems. So I have a lot of sympathy for the strikers, but of course, no one wants to see strikes because it has a knock-on impact on the economy and other people in the private sector suffer. So it's a terribly vicious circle that we somehow have to get out of. At the moment, for whatever reason, you won't blame Brexit. I, may, I might blame Brexit in part. There are lots of other reasons, as we've discussed. But for whatever combination of reasons, as a society, we aren't quite getting it right. Harrison, back to you. In terms of um, re-encouraging growth in the economy, what would you like to see um, get done? Because it's OK for Jeremy Hunt to, to go to Washington and talk tough to the IMF, but he's got his hands on the levers of power. What would you like to see him do? Well, I'm, I'm never going to oppose uh, any kind of income tax cut um, or tax cuts of any kind, really. The tax burden is uh, at almost its highest since the Second World War. The state uh, is enormous uh, in terms of not just its pure size, but the scope of what it regulates in our economy. Uh, everything is either banned or regulated, it seems, when the, it's brought to the government's attention. Uh, but the fundamental underpinning issue is that the supply side of the economy is in the parts of the economy that actually make things and are productive uh, and then pass on those things that they create to consumers uh, for them to enjoy. Uh, that side of our economy is uh, significantly burdened by uh, bad regulation, by burdens of taxes and by the illiberal panic system we have. If you take housing as the, the consumer's example, there is now an entire generation of people in the UK under the age of 35 who have been unable effectively to get on the property ladder with the exception of very few who are rather wealthy. Uh, that is not uh, the sign of a, a healthy economy. Uh, it is the sign very much of a sick one and one that is geared by the state uh, in favour of people who already own property and who are already uh, able to, uh, uh, to, to already have been able to create wealth rather than those people who are uh, active at the beginning of their working life uh, and creating wealth for the future. Uh, Matthew, back to you. One of the key drivers of people's economic hardship right now, of course, is spiralling energy costs and also petrol. There's an anti ulez protest today happening in London. Would you like to see a step towards energy sovereignty? Is the answer to be drilling our own shale, getting our own coal going, and not being a slave to net zero, which seems to be impoverishing the poorest workers. No, it, it might not surprise you, Martin, to, to find out that I'm actually in, in favour of net zero and meeting our targets, because although we've undoubtedly got a cost of living crisis, I talked about that 10% inflation, people really struggling to make ends meet. No one wants to see that. No one wants to see people actually having to choose between heating and eating, nonetheless, there is a, a, a global catastrophe on the cards that we need to do our bit towards. It's no good saying, well, let's wait until China does something. Yeah, China's not doing nearly enough. But if we don't do our bit, how can we lecture China or not lecture China, but try to persuade them to get round the table and be a world leader? And so, there is a real opportunity here for us to lead the world and also in innovation, to make money, to build our economy, to build a properly green Economy, And I hope if Labour does get the chance to be in power, and that's very much uncertain as things stand, not least because of what Olivia was saying about Starmer's approval ratings. But if Labour does get in, into power, I hope that they take the economy, the, the green economy, very, very seriously. I was not a fan of Boris Johnson in any shape or form. But one thing he did appear to take quite seriously were green issues. You, you say we need to get, uh, to get energy sovereignty. Obviously, I'd love us to have energy sovereignty. I want us to have energy security. But the way to do that isn't through coal, isn't through shale, isn't through fracking, which can do terrible damage to our local environments and to beauty spots and also threaten, yeah. threaten people's safety up to a point. The way to do that is to continue, I think, building offshore wind and other mechanisms, perhaps more solar and so forth, in order to move forward and to move forward both in a green way and in an economically literate way that develops our economy. OK, Harrison, I want to put the same question to you. Um, a lot of people are complaining, the, the, the poorest workers, that the net zero is making them impoverished. Quickly, is net zero bankrupt in the working classes and should we look at being energy sovereign? Uh, it certainly could be. And I think that, that decarbonisation is a very noble goal and one that we definitely should aspire to. But it's about the exact way that you do it. So, for example, if you want to build more offshore wind, subsidies are... 
maybe part but not all of the answer uh, onshore and offshore wind are both burdened by i hate to be a broken record but our absurdly burdensome planning system uh, and when it comes to the government effectively creating a massive industrial strategy of new subsidies and regulations to get our way to net zero all that's doing is making us poorer what we can do is put a simple price on carbon through a carbon tax and encourage the market to innovate ways to adapt around that what the government do is doing now is artificially picking winners and losers and increasing prices for consumers and which is you know particularly potent uh, in, during a cost of living crisis uh, and an inflationary period which is so informed by high energy prices well, that was a full fair and balanced debate thank you very much for your time this afternoon matthew stadlin and harrison griffiths and please enjoy the grand national